Hi, Misha here, and those who follow the channel know we do a number of Kalashnikovs. And one of my favorites, not my maybe absolute favorite, but one of my favorites, and one I wanted for a very long time, was a Polish KBKG WZ60. A unique variant based on the AK Type 3. But it's been several years since we've featured it exclusively. Typically it appears in other videos. Well, recently, Arms of America got in some WZ-60 parts kits. Including with the grenade launcher backpack and accessories. So, it seemed like a great time to both talk about the development, history, service of this unique gun from Yuxnik Factory, Circle 11, today FB Radom, and also take a close look at one of the parts kits, see what we received. And as always, if you could, because this was something that I bought. This was not given or loaned or sent to us as a teeny. I bought it because I'm a sucker for kits, and I've had great luck in the past with kits from Arms of America. Anyway, if you'd like to help support us, check out the link to Patreon. And if you can't do that, understand. Just liking, sharing, subscribing, and staying with me as I ramble on. That's, that's pretty good, too. So, we'll dive in. At first glance, especially in this configuration, this might just seem very much like a traditional AK Type 3. Here's my Russian. This is, of course, also a kit build on an old firing line receiver, but nice Russian parts, hardwood furniture, and a correct magazine. In fact, we had this out to the range just a few months ago. It's always good to let your guns stretch their legs. They don't like being uh, stabled up too much. So, yeah, let's take a look. Russian. So trying one of the slab sides from Atlantic. Always fun. It's always surprising just how smooth, although somewhat heavy, these original milled AKs are. And we haven't had this gun out in a number of years. And the footage we did record with it was with the old potato camera. And you guys don't want to see that, I'm sure. But I have had this gun since actually uh, late 2014. I remember because I was looking for it very much and I found that it is, is it always happens at the worst possible time. We had just moved, money was tight, we were even just in a car wreck. Somehow, though, I managed to scrape up money for it, and I'm glad I did because you just don't find these. This is a SSR-99P, which these, this was assembled by Gordon Tech using a Bulgarian milled receiver, one of the handful of semi-automatic true import milled receivers brought over, and an original kit, very, very similar to the one we just got from Arms of America, although with one difference we will talk about. This, too, is, of course, built from a kit, one of the old PLO kits that Israel had. So why did I want this AK Type 3 so much? For one, yes, I do collect Polish guns, but for another, this is quite a unique gun. And I think after this video, you'll kind of get why. So let's talk about the AK getting into Polish Army service. The story begins in 1954. Before that time, Poland had been manufacturing the Mosin de Gant M44 under license, calling it the KBK WZ44, basically 
carbine model of 1944 and actually recently we just looked at it in a Mosin video so you can check that out. And they also had submachine guns like the PPSH-41 and PPS-43 and their own unique variant, the PPS-4352. Again, something we looked at towards the beginning of the year again. They needed to modernize though, get with the program, get the new 762 by 39 cartridge. It might kind of seem quaint today, but this was a big step forward, an intermediate round. So the original plan was to kind of follow the Soviet doctrine and adopt the AK to replace the submachine gun, the SKS to replace the infantry rifle, and the RPD to become the new light machine gun. So basically replacing the Mosin bolt action, the PPS submachine gun, and the at the time, the P-28 light machine gun they were using. And of course, other guns that they had in smaller numbers like the ABS-36. Even a handful of SVT-40s. In 1955, they set about negotiating with the Soviets for production rights, and they picked up a few hundred of each gun for testing. The Polish would designate the SKS as the KSS, they would designate the AK Type 3 as the PMK, which basically stands for Kalashnikov Handheld Submachine Gun or Machine Gun, because again, that's what they thought it was. And the uh, RPD would become the RKMD. Again, changing up the nomenclature a little bit. So things were all set to go forward. They had a few of each in service and they began testing. And then they quickly realized that the SKS was superfluous. It was really no cheaper or easier to mass produce. In fact, in some ways, it was harder to produce than the AK and offered no real advantage. So in 1956, they basically backed out of picking up the KSS production line. The Soviets were not happy about this, but in the end, they acquiesced because they still were taking the, at the time, PMK and the RKMD, amongst other things, and the Soviets definitely were financially benefiting. So, production would be set up at the Oxnick factory, which had the code of 11. This is the circle 11 you see on Polish things. And by the end of that year, the first RKMDs were turned out. It's kind of the first one they went to. But in 1957, the first P MKs would come out, although very low rate production the first couple of years, and they were still building with a lot of Russian parts, and they would look identical to this gun, except for maybe a few unique Polish twists and very nice Polish bluing and whatnot. So before I bore you to death, we'll start looking at the kit, but I will say, because this is me, that Poland was never content just to produce an exact cloner copy. Already, by the very beginning, 1958 at the very earliest, they started doing their own variants. They started off by doing a version of the AKS, which was the underfolding. The Polish would really take to underfolding stocks, but that's later. And then they would look into doing custom variants. For example, they looked at a night fighting version quite early on using the uh, NSP2 optic and we've actually looked at some Polish night fighting guns including the AKML for more on that history you can check the video out they also thought about doing a heavy barrel version now they would still have the 16 inch barrel but it would be thicker and instead of giving it a drum mag, they actually took two 30-round mags, which, by the way, they built the ribbed mag. They never did do the slab side. And they welded them together to give a capacity of roughly 56, 57 rounds. Yeah, the, the Polish never really had the RPK. Of course, that never went into production either. They also had two long barrel versions, thought to be kind of DMRs, kind of like Yugoslavian Tabuk. 
One of the other guns they worked on was the grenade launcher variant because rifle grenades were important to them. This was initially known as the PMK DGG, like say DGN. But in 1959-1960, the naming nomenclature would change because by this time, PMK really didn't describe it. These weren't being deployed as submachine guns. No, these were being deployed as infantry rifles. And with that, let's see what we have in the first bag. Alrighty, here we go. Kind of the initial components. All the small trigger parts, pins and springs are in this bag. I'm not going to open it. It's it's pretty standard. Looks like there might be a... Yeah, there's a bottom tang in there as well. We do get a receiver, or at least two-thirds of it. We have the rear section with the top tang. Per law, it's cut. It's one of the cleaner cuts I've seen. I'll give credit there. We have a full trigger guard with the correct mag catch. This is actually a later style mag catch, more of a thinner stamped piece, because it looks like our kit, if you can see it, or rather I can get it in, is from 1969, which was actually an interesting transitional year we'll talk about later. And we have the front stub with, at least on mine, intact lug notches recesses which is good if you want to do a re-weld back when i did this gun or when this gun was made i should say re-welds really weren't that popular but then again with arsenal receivers they did not need to be and then we have this remember how i said there was one difference between this kit and this one now here it is, the barrel. I guess to their credit, you do get all the pieces of the barrel. There's a front stub here, a middle section, and then the gas block, and the front section with a unique feature we'll talk about in a minute. Unfortunately, around 2005, the ATF under the Bush White House decided that barrels, once used on select fire guns, on machine guns, should no longer be allowed to be imported with parts kits, at least intact usable. Now, any open import contracts, permissions at the time would be allowed, but as these would dry up, they would no longer give new ones. So over the next handful of years, barrels disappeared with kits and keep in mind too this is not the same barrel as an AKM while it is 16 and a quarter inches long it has a heavier profile especially back here in different hardware also unique to this gun is the front here let's look at that a little closer oh almost forgot in the first bag there was also the cleaning rod small thing but nice that they have it notice from this stub the unique front this was so that it could mate up with its grenade launcher attachment called the L O N dash one but I'm kinda getting ahead of myself like I said, in 1959, the names changed. The PMK, the standard version, became the KBKAK for Carbine Automatic Kalashnikov. But the PMK DGN became the KBKG WZ60 or 1960 if you prefer. Why did it get a full Polish name? Well, that's because this was a unique flavor, a unique variant that they did. It wasn't just a straight copy. And you'll see this throughout uh, Polish uh, production of, of various things. Whenever they would make their own variant, they would give it its own name if they 
just kind of straight copied the Russian, they would let it keep the Russian name. really wish I had modern shooting footage of this gun to show you because it does have its original Polish barrel with a nice bore. But again, you don't want to see old potato camera. Notice it does have the taper. Same as the stub here. Fun fact, when Century Arms did their M1960 Sporter, they copied this kind of extended piece but they didn't taper it down when they made their u.s barrels so it actually left more threads and these are standard threads 14 by 1 left hand but when you looked at the century 1960s they had a little bit more thread so if you screwed a nut down it um, would actually protrude a bit if you went all the way they do also have a unique front plunger that can easily be done by hand it's larger and more secure Again, for grenade launching attachment. And they also had a unique nut to kind of work with. Here it is. It's tapered on the inside to work with the taper here. Probably hard to see. Here's a standard nut. And they will interchange, at least this will. Although this is really meant for only this gun. Here is the special nut on my gun. It protects the crown. Here is the standard nut on the stub. I do have it screwed down by hand. Notice how it does protrude just a little bit and leaves a little bit of a gap there. Probably something that most would not notice, but I figured might as well pointed out. Let's compare the receiver stubs and then we'll open up the second plastic bag. The Arsenal Bulgarian receivers that Gordon Tech used really are a good ringer, namely with the lightning cuts you see here. The only place it's a little obvious, this has the newer dimpled Bulgarian mag catch whereas it should have had the flat style either the earlier thicker one or this later than one. You can also see the grenade valve which is on here. Now we do have actually have two different shapes ever so slightly but it's just mostly production variations flat front and of course the rear section lines up perfectly well here too being a double tang flipping over this is a great receiver the only real downside is you do miss the original markings also this used a original screw in barrel Newer guns, including the Polytech Legend, have a press and pin in, so AKM style barrel. So you can see that there. You could always replicate the markings if you wanted, but that's one of the benefits to rewelds. Also, looking at the rear section, note there's no sling swivel. Unique amongst AK Type 3s, the swivel was actually on the buttstock for logistical reasons because of uh, grenade launching. And of course, this is unique buttstock itself. But it's one way you can tell one of the stubs from a, a 60 kit is it won't, uh, won't have the sling slot. So what do you think? On to bag two. That was louder coming out of the bag on the table than I expected because it was all kind of one piece. Here we go. We have a pretty standard top cover. It's the heavier AK Type 3 style. Fun fact, the AK-2 Type 2 had an even heavier top cover. Notice it's blued. Also notice the bolt carrier is blued. When you think of the original AK, you often think of um, this being in the polished white. Also notice it does have the trip. That's actually because the finish would change. 
And for that, we have to go back to the history. Like I said, this was adopted in 1960 as a infantry rifle grenade launching variant with the original just Type 3 mill being the infantry variant and underfolding too. In 1966, Poland went to the AKM, which they called the KBK AKM. Now, it was, it was a little unique because it retained the blued finish, polished bolt carrier, and generally speaking, hardwood furniture, at least for a time, through at least 1968. Like I said, this kit is the 1969 dated one, which was a transitional year. Finishes would switch between 69 and 70 from blued to paint. Kind of a unique paint that Radom is still famous for today. And furniture would switch from hardwood, at least the buttstock and forearm, to laminated. Also, pistol grips will go, but we'll talk about that in a bit when we get to the wood. So changes would happen, and the WZ-60 would be no different. Now you might think, why didn't they replace it with an AKM? Well, they felt that the AKM with its stamped receiver, which, to be fair, they had stamped receiver prototypes as early as 1960 themselves, kind of reverse engineering Russian ones, they just weren't sure it would be strong enough to launch rifle grenades. So they kept the grenade launching variant in production with the milled receiver, at least into the 70s. And so it would get some changes as uh, time would go on, including the uh, blued finish going to paint. This seems blued to me in this kit, but you could get paint as well. Your uh, rear sight, wherever I stuck it, was in. Oh, I don't know what I was it's a standard rear sight. There it is. Why don't you tell me, guys? It was in this bag instead of the other. I'm not sure why it's removed from the stub, but there it is. Carrier is pretty standard, and you might think your recoil spring, but no. Now this has the machined rod, not the later wire type, but back here it has a lock. Anyone who knows a tantal is familiar with this, and much for the same reason this is on a tantal, it's there to keep the, the cover from flying off if you launch a rifle grenade. So my gun too. Kind of unique Polish part that actually persisted in use up until the early days of the WZ-96 Burial. Of course, today it's replaced by the automatic one. So yeah, not a whole lot to look at in this kit. Just got our parts here. Everything looks fine. By the way, this kit also came with this 30 round mag. It's kind of a free little bonus. So I guess the last thing to look at, the furniture itself. I'm happy that they did not put all the metal parts in one bag, splitting them up. I'm very happy they actually split up the wood furniture into its own bags and paper wrapped it instead of plastic. AOA didn't tape it up, they just wrapped it up, which is fine. And here we go. No surprises. Standard slab sided thick lower. Seems to be hardwood. The upper guards in Poland are always a little different wood type than the lowers, even going back further. And our gas tube. But the ports in the tube. We have a checkered sided pistol grip. A little bit of wear here, a few dings, but not bad. Metal ferrule on top. And then we have our unique buttstock. The rear is standard. Nice butt plate. This seems to be hardwood too. But it has these brackets on the side, which is all part of this gun's shtick. So yeah, around 1970, 69, 70, they would go from hardwood to the rather famous Polish laminate wood, which is 
really among the most attractive and strongest out there. Also, pistol grips would transition over to that uh, Bakelite. First for the AKM, so they would start off with kind of a black speckled one, then a brown one. But then the WZ60 would go from wood grips to Bakelite type, becoming redder and redder over time. Or if guns came in with a broken wood grip, it would get replaced. So when Century put Bakelite grips on theirs, they were uh, they were not incorrect, at least for later ones. So there you have it. And just before we move on, here's a Polish Type 1 bayonet. Notice it fits it, because this was to be used as a standard infantry rifle quite a bit of the time. Standard overall length, height, weight. Just had an additional roll if needed. And while the AOA kit did not come with a bayonet, and we did get the mag, the main draw, the main accessories are in this Grenadier backpack. So let's look what we get and then let's transform my rifle. And since you guys keep asking for it, before we transform it, here is the old potato footage. Don't say I didn't warn you. I warned you about the potato footage, but you insisted on it. As far as this kit, let's be honest, the milled receiver stubs are cool, but only useful if you plan to do a re-weld. The barrel is useless. It, the other parts are good, especially the furniture. Having an extra little mag thrown in as a little bonus is nice. But this section here is pretty, pretty great. You get the backpack itself. On top, there is the grenade launcher spigot in its little pouch. And there's a wrench for it, or to remove the um, cap. Pulling it back, we have some other components here. We have a two-chamber oil bottle, which is, well, ironically oily. We have a three-cell Polish mag pouch. You can tell them because this pocket on the side is actually larger for the Polish oiler. Pretty standard. You have a strap here for the backpack. And you have a sling up here. Standard 70s, 80s era Polish sling. Under it, we have a cleaning kit tube. And that's because when this is assembled as a grenade launcher, you can't get to the one in the buttstock because we put this rubber boot on. It straps on. We all like strap-ons. And we have a spot here in the pouch for three rifle grenades. And here, there's a section for this, the grenade sight. This is one of two variations. And correspondingly, the pouch will actually differ here slightly, too. And then finally, we have the special magazine for the grenade launching. What makes it special? I'm glad you asked. This is not a cut-down mag. It was purpose-built as a 10-rounder. You can notice the ribs don't quite make it all the way to the bottom. There's a bit of a gap. Nice polish finish. And for blanks, there's a small insert in the front that won't allow standard 762 by 39 rounds to fit in. Well, it's not 100% true. Because of how the block sits, you can actually get two rounds in the top, kind of filling the top row. But that's it. If you try to put a third cartridge in, it won't go. I just thought I would mention that as a safety warning. PSA, you can't get two in there. 
And that would be bad to launch a rifle grenade with live rounds. Don't want to do that. So those are the components we need to make this into a rifle grenade launcher. So with that, let's transform mine from an infantry rifle, able to fire 600 rounds per minute in the original form, to an infantry single shot bolt action grenade launcher, able to shoot roughly two grenades per minute. So much fire, much slower fire rate, but much bigger boom. Here it is all kitted up. Obviously you just unscrew the muzzle nut, remember a left hand thread, and you screw on the LON1, the LON1 extension. There is no detent, it just torques down. Use your wrench, and uh, this large button comes into play. Now on mine, it came with the earlier milled grenade sight. This clamps on with a thumb screw to the rear sight and has this neat little level built in. This, frankly larger, but simpler and lighter sheet steel or stamped version, and it is adjustable, it's got a little ratchet system in it. It's funny, whenever I tried this off camera, I can get it. But anyway, it adjusts. This came into use around the same time as the paint finish, the laminated wood, the plastic pistol grips, around 1970, give or take. <clears throat> and the other major component we add is the rubber butt plate. It actually slots in here. These are keyed, so you can come from the top or the bottom, then rotate and stretch on that way it won't pop off while you're shooting it and that way you can easily install it in the field because you never know and like I said you can't get to your cleaning kit now so that's probably why there's a second one in there and that's pretty well the setup like this the overall length is about 42 and a third inches and the weight is about 10 pounds 4 ounces including with the short magazine unloaded. But of course, this won't do a whole lot, and it does get bigger and longer. And here it is with an infantry grenade attached, a rifle grenade. Yes, YouTube, this is not only inert, it's actually a practice dummy one. It never had explosive in it. But yeah, if you add it, now you're getting up to 50 inches long, and... Depending on the exact warhead type, you're well over 11 pounds. You know, not a light package. However, it does give the infantrymen the ability to take out light, even medium armor, or emplacements. It is a type of force multiplier that was very popular in the Cold War. Russia never really went for this system, but... Poland did, as did Yugoslavia, quite famously. Here's that screw here. Quite easy to put on. And there you go. That is the complete system from tip to tip. And I hope you see kind of now what makes this unique. Oh, and of course the gas cutoff here. You're definitely going to want it in single shot mode for launching grenades, easy enough to switch back and forth with. And of course you cannot use your bayonet lug when this is on. So that's potentially what you can turn your AOA parts kit into, a rifle like this. Just to really drive home how long this is, I brought out another build from another AOA parts kit that I had done a few years back. This is a Polish KBK AKM early kit, actually, 1968, I believe. And it uh, goes to show you, you, you can't tell, but I can, moving these around. It's considerably lighter, too. has a transitional sling. Again, this is early, late. Neither here nor there. But yeah, these went into production in 1966. 
and while the standard milled AK would go out, the WZ-60 would stay in. In fact, in 1972, a variant would be introduced, the KBKG WZ-60-72. This was developed primarily for the Airborne. It was primarily the exact same gun, except the stock and receiver were modified so that the stock could be quickly attached or removed. Essentially, you had spring-loaded push buttons top and bottom you would squeeze in and pull the stock out. The tangs on the receiver were shortened and modified with new holes so that it would work, and the stock itself had a metal end cap where it would go in. But it still had the brackets for the boot and all that. And I did actually own one of those stocks. I got it from Robert RTG about 12 years ago. And I sold it when we were getting ready to move because I didn't own one of these guns and it looked unlikely that I would. Oh well, such is life, you know. It was a beautiful stock too, unissued. Tear. But then I found this Gordon Tech. SSR-99P, which honestly was just kind of dumb luck. Uh, they were built on Arsenal receivers imported by Arsenal USA, later known as Armory USA, and only 500, some say even less, were built in 99 through 2000, 2001, because very quickly Gordon Tech and Arsenal slash Armory had a falling out, and Intric would actually end up with the uh, SLR 100 receiver imports and so on and so forth. And there would also be a run of guns called the SSR 99, which were actually Bulgarian parts assembled on Bulgarian receivers in 760 by 39 here. About 250 of those were done before the falling out. And there was even a very small run, maybe 150 at most, of the K101 which was the same notion, but in 5.56, five, probably some of the earliest milled 5.56s five, five, in America. Just thought I'd plug that in. Why not? Just to kind of give the history of this gun. It also explains why I was not really optimistic about finding one. But they really did do a great job, and the kits were in great shape at the time. These, of course, kind of cool too, because Poland didn't actually make many fixed stock kits, at least not compared to underfolders. As for the KBKG production, it would continue on until 1974, when it was finally retired, suspended from that, because its replacement was ready to go. Going back to 1968, give or take, they started working on an underbarrel grenade launcher to use the bayonet lug for the stamped guns. And it was finally introduced that year, the Polad Underbarrel Grenade Launcher. And when it was issued with an AKM or AKMS, they were known as the KBKG WZ-74. So, stamp gun, underbarrel launcher. But just because the 60s and 60-72s were out of production, they definitely stayed in service within Poland for years to come even experiencing a small renaissance in the 1990s when 545 and the Tantal were declared obsolete and until the Burial and 556 were ready, the AKM, AKMS, and even, yeah, the old mill guns were brought out as substitute standard along with 760 by 39 Polish history is fun. It's been commonly reported that about 50,000 fixed-stocked AKMs were built in Poland and 300,000 underfolder AKMSs. Take that for what you will. A little more firm are the numbers of these produced. For the 6072s, the quick detach stock version, only 500 were built. After all, they were only in production a year or two, so, you know, very short run. As far as the fixed stock version, yeah, pretty uncommon as well. Only about 5,000. So 5,500 total. And while most served within Poland, a few were exported. For example, the at the time new communist nation of Cuba ended up with a few. Cuba kind of got a lot of everything. The North Vietnamese would end up with a handful, which would be used in the Vietnam War. The uh, Lebanese, uh, 
Lebanon would end up with some, which Israel would go up against in the 80s, even capturing some. Likewise, the PLO would get a handful, small number, Palestinians, and Israel would capture a handful of those as well. And they would turn up here and there throughout. But again, the majority would stay within Poland. So what do you think? I always thought it was a really cool gun, and of course you get Polish quality. And it's fun to collect because of the variations and changes that they did. And just the, the overall attention to detail that uh, Poland applies. It's one reason amongst many that I enjoy these. I like this one too. The AKMs are fun. So what do you think? With that, let's end by kind of looking at everything that comes in the parts kit one more time. Then we'll wrap it up. And here everything is together, put together as best I could. I usually like doing my parts kits like this just to give you an idea of what is and isn't there. Also works for like gun broker photography when you're selling things. Of course here's our kit again. Yeah it's sad they didn't have any grenades, dummy I mean, I asked. But I do think it's cool it came with the 10 round mag that usually is not included because well you can't really use it. The, uh, the mag pouch is also neat and the sling, why not? It's complete here. There are variations in these pouches. Mine, for example, that came with mine has different uh, hooks for the grenades and of course it doesn't have the spot for the stamped sight. It has actually a spot for a cleaning kit there and the sight goes elsewhere. Of course this goes there. So you will see variations, but that is appropriate for what I received here, 1969. They had both painted and blued finishes and they had hardwood or laminate. They also gave an option of Bakelite, plastic, or wood pistol grip. And conditions ranged from battlefield pickup to very good to very good plus, not quite near excellent. This is a quote-unquote very good kit, so, you know, metal. And I think it's in good shape for what it is. Can't really comment on the barrel. That's unfortunate, but it is neat you got all the barrel stubs. I didn't press my handguard retainer all the way back because a little bit of slag on the barrel is kind of stopping it. Oh well. Set it up for you here. Here we can see how much of the receiver is missing, approximately. A little more than a third, but again at least we have the full lug recesses up here and we have the rear trunnion and we have a bag of small parts nice safety correct rod and bolt carrier and hey they were nice enough to basically give a free 30 round mag I think they asked me when I ordered it if I wanted a free mag or something else and I can't remember what it was I, I got this about six weeks ago but, um, yeah, there is the kit. Good potential for a reweld, or just a good source of spare parts because they're sure not making these anymore. The only negative is the fact that the barrel had to be cut up. Such is life, guys. But what do you think? Is this of interest to you? And if so, is it just the mechanics, or do you like the history? And ending with the other side, assembled as much as I can. Actually having the latch on this dust cover makes it easier. Couldn't quite put the stock in by hand. I'm sure I could with the mallet. Same goes for getting the bolt carrier to go home. It almost does, but a little bit of leftover slag here is preventing it. Same goes for that hand of guard retainer I was telling you about. But as you can see, save this section here. 
you get everything. And just mine is a comparison since it was already here. Repeating again, you would need the correct barrel and you'll need either a receiver repair section to re-weld or a complete receiver. Your choice. Of course, if someone just wanted to use this to make a display gun, you could clean up the barrel, put it back together with JB Weld, find a piece of bar stock for the middle and do that. It's up to you. But it seemed like something interesting and fun, and I haven't really talked about the history of the KBKG in a long while. And speaking of, you know, that old video <laughs> where we shot mine was seven years ago. And I think I'll let old Misha kind of end the video just for fun. But back then we did not have a Patreon, so I will say here and now, if you could... Go over and help support us with the Patreon. Much obliged. If not, that's okay too. Liking, sharing, subscribing always helps. Also on behalf of Fox, we'll catch you very soon. And we're handing it back over to Misha seven years ago to end this video. But yeah, if you get a chance to check out or, or purchase a Polish AK, be it original or... Um, one built from a kit. They're, they're excellent guns. Yeah, this is the KBG WZ 1960 grenade launching milled. And that's this thought we'd share it with you on this afternoon. Well, this is Misha, and as always, if you have any